and it is a, a real pleasure for me to introduce Andrew, who I met, I think, for the first time about a decade ago. Is yes, that's right. right. Yeah. Um, so Andrew uh, O'Shaughnessy, or more particularly Andrew Jackson O'Shaughnessy, great name, uh, is the vice president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, the Saunders director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, and a professor of history at the University of Virginia. Uh, he was born in Britain, uh, where he earned his undergraduate degree and doctorate at Oxford University. Uh, and his most recent book, which I know many of you have uh, right with you today, and of course it's uh, for sale uh, outside this room uh, after the session, is uh, The Men Who Lost America, uh, British Leadership, the American Revolution, and the Fate of the Empire, published by Yale University Press. Uh, it has won five major national awards, including the New York Historical Society American History Book Prize, and the George Washington History Prize. So uh, join us in welcoming uh, uh, Andrew. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and uh, I'm very grateful to Dane Kennedy and Amanda Manitz uh, at the National History Center for this invitation. Thank you, too, for providing suitably British weather as well. <laughs> and I'm also grateful to the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center, Christian Osterman and Pete uh, Beistack. Uh, oh, sorry, it's Beistack, right. Um, well, I thought it might amuse you to begin with if I just showed you the US cover to this book and the British cover. They're actually different, <laughs> and it does show, I suppose, how marketing can rear itself even when we're trying to write objective history. This is the US edition, and uh, both books have exactly the same uh, painting on the cover. It's John Singleton Copley. It's actually a scene from Gibraltar which reinforces one of the points of the book about the global nature of the war, um, but it's the scene of one of Britain's only triumphs. It's actually the longest siege ever withstood by the British Army that lasted uh, four years. Needless to say, uh, the British tended not to paint their defeats. So there is no uh, series like John Trumbull illustrating the American Revolution. But this is a detail from the painting. The painting itself is like a life-size mural that was kept in Gibraltar for 40 years from the Second World War. And in many ways, the Yale cover reinforces a perception that the book is written against, since you basically have two leaders. Uh, the senior one, who's actually called Augustus Elliot, uh, looking very imperious, pointing into the distance, much like a sort of Lawrence Olivier character. And Olivier, in fact, did once play Burgoyne, um, pointing into the distance. And his junior commander looking up at him, and as a friend of mine once said, looking quizzically as if to say, are you being serious? <laughs> <laughs> it, also has, it also has my full uh, name with my middle name. Um, Jackson was my mother's maiden name, but my father had read the Arthur Schlesinger biography of Jackson, which it was very uncomplicated. It mentioned nothing about Indian removal, and he was a mother of Andrew Jackson. And finally, the subtitle is slightly different. It's British leadership, and the very last part is the fate of empire. This is the British cover. And as you see, you've got a rugby scrum of red notes, uh, looking very victorious. They even wanted to change the title, pointing out that no one in Britain is interested in defeats. <laughs> and uh, the, my middle name has disappeared because they were worried that I might sound American. <laughs> and then my, the subtitle was changed instead of British leadership is British command, which has a slightly different tone to it. And instead of the fate of empire, it's the preservation 
of the empire. <laughs> and there was a, a figure in the corner, almost looking Christ-like, being crucified, who's also disappeared in this uh, uh, view of the painting. Now, this clearly was a war, seemingly, that Britain should have won. Britain had just fought what, in this country, we think of as the French and Indian War. In Europe, it's the Seven Years' War, in which it had been victorious, which made it a global power. It not only acquired uh, Canada, but also Bengal, which gave it its main foothold in India. It went on to win the French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. In other words, the American Revolution was an aberration. And one of the favorite popular ideas of why the British lost was through ineffective leadership. And I'll refer, come back to this later. But that's why I decided to look at the problems of waging the American Revolution through the 10 key decision makers, both political and military. Because I wanted to stress that military decisions are not made in a vacuum. They're often political imperatives as well. And I essentially introduce these 10 figures in biographical cameos, much like a play. Uh, I collected biographies, certainly a form used before, but these are collected biographies written on a timeline. Each figure is introduced when essentially they become key to the decision making, key to the plot. So the main problem is obviously it involves some repetition but often uh, worthwhile reinforcement, and often looking at a, a particular moment like Saratoga from several different perspectives. So I'm going to introduce those 10 key decision makers first, although what I largely want to focus on for this audience is my explanation of why Britain lost the revolution. And clearly, although leadership played a part. Uh, my emphasis is elsewhere. Obviously, one thing you would expect to find in the book, uh, and that I think is still known to every high schooler, was George III. Uh, George III, who is blamed by Jefferson, of course, as the tyrant. Uh, much of the Declaration of Independence is written against him. Uh, what I found interesting about George III was that, in fact, he played very little role in the decisions that led to uh, the American Revolution and in the formation of British policy. On the other hand, people can keep him as their villain because after the Boston Tea Party, he became Britain's leading war hawk. This portrait of him is at the height of the war in 1779. Ironically, by an American artist, his favorite artist, Benjamin West of Pennsylvania. And at this point of the war, he was literally holding the government together. Uh, a Cambridge historian writing immediately after the Second World War, Herbert Butterfield, said that there was something almost Churchillian about his letters. He would write, if any eight men will stand beside me, I intend to go on. Uh, he said that he regarded anyone as essentially uh, committing treason who spoke out against the war and encouraging the enemy. He believed that if Britain lost the war, it would cease to be a major power in Europe. And this really eliminates, I think, one myth on the other side of the Atlantic, where, of course, very few people really inform themselves of the history of the American Revolution, but they would love to say to a friend from America or a tourist, oh, that was the little war in the colonies, it wasn't important. This is one of the longest wars in both British and American history, and the British took it very seriously. George III's belief that Britain would cease to be a major power was even shared by those who opposed the war, so it's a widely uh, shared belief. George III felt so strongly that he twice actually wrote out his abdication speech and was even planning to leave and live in Hanover 
in Germany rather than face the prospect of the loss of America. After the Battle of Yorktown, George III wrote to Lord George Germain, his the principal minister in London responsible for the war, and said, this is a minor setback, this is like Saratoga, we must go on. Germain, in fact, began the planning for the next phase of the war at the beginning of 1782. The man who was responsible for the policies <coughs> that led to the war was Lord North, seen here in the robes of the Chancellor of the University of Oxford. I've often said it should be the sister university of UVA. Uh, they both have undergraduates who boast that their the homes have lost courses. <laughs> and they, they both claim to be the home of the Cavaliers. Oxford really was the headquarters of uh, British royalists during the English Civil War. Lord North was responsible for the Tea Act and was responsible for what in Britain are called the Coercive Acts in the spring of 1774 and what uh, in America are called the Intolerable Acts. Ironically, he helped to diffuse the situation in America for about three years to the extent that Britain uh, was more worried about a war with Spain than a war in America. But nevertheless, in reaction to the Boston Tea Party, the Coercive Acts essentially uh, act as the catalyst for the war. What interested me, though, about Lord North was that as soon as he realized that the problem went beyond Massachusetts, uh, and he realized that in about December of 1774, when he read the resolutions of the Continental Congress and realized that there really was unity between the 13 colonies, he immediately started to backpedal, and he continued to try to backpedal for the rest of the war. Lord North went to great lengths to engage in some forms of negotiation. His first act was to offer what's known as his conciliatory bill at the beginning of 1775, which would have allowed the colonies to tax themselves. Uh, he made his best offer in 1778, what's known as the Carlisle Peace Commission, in which essentially he was holding out merely a token British leadership uh, and promised that Britain would never tax the colonies, a promise incidentally which it largely kept in the British West Indies uh, and in uh, much of the rest of the empire, other than in, um, trade taxes, uh, but not direct taxes. Um, and he tried all forms of negotiation secretly, often in opposition to his own ministers and to the king. And this is a man who's all too often regarded as a rubber stamp, as someone who merely enacted the wishes of the king, and yet he went out on a limb to try to negotiate. To this day, it's popular to speak in Parliament of someone being the worst prime minister since Lord North. <laughs> so he's gone down in history as Britain's worst prime minister. It was very popular, especially during the Macmillan years to use this uh, phrase, uh, which is very unfair because essentially he's only known as being a bad minister because of Britain's loss of America. In fact, he was one of the great parliamentarians in the 18th century, one of the only prime ministers who managed to survive a war for as long as he did. Remember, Sir Robert Walpole, who is often regarded as Britain's first prime minister and is the prime minister against whom uh, North is compared disfavorably, Walpole fell from office at the beginning of a war with Spain. Most prime ministers didn't survive. He was one of the great <coughs> oratorians in uh, Parliament, one of the greatest speakers. Uh, he would come into Parliament at noon, just as sessions were warming up, and he would stay often to the early hours of the morning. He'd wait till late at night and then give a two-hour speech without a single 
note. Now we today admire British Prime Ministers for doing a one hour question time once a week in Parliament. Lord North was doing this for three days a week. Furthermore, he held essentially two modern positions. He was not only the Prime Minister, but he fulfilled the role of a modern Chancellor of the Exchequer, or here what we call the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, he was the one responsible for negotiating the budget, which he did personally. And it's well worth keeping in mind that Britain remained solvent during the American Revolution. Despite the fact that the national debt was the greatest fear, every prime minister essentially in the 18th century was chosen for their financial acumen and their ability to work with the debt, because this was the great domestic concern. It was one of the main reasons why Britain originally taxed America. France, on the other hand, went bankrupt as a result of its involvement in the uh, American Revolution. North negotiated all those loans. One of the reasons he was so anxious that the war not continue, he was so anxious to have a negotiated compromise, is that he believed it would, in fact, bankrupt uh, Britain. Now, there's one chapter with two personalities, and that is the Howe brothers, Sir William Howe and his brother, Lord Richard Howe. And this, of course, sounds the ultimate old boy set up, two brothers in charge of the army and navy. But these two brothers were two of the greatest pioneers in their respective spheres in the 18th century British military. Far from being uh, the next in command, uh, Sir William Howe was chosen over 105 more senior generals. So just as Wolfe was chosen as a junior general during the French and Indian War, the British did the same during the American Revolution. They chose Sir William Howe because his great strength was in light infantry, which we might liken to modern day commando troops. He'd served in America. Indeed, he'd served at what would be regarded as the great British victory of the 18th century. He'd served alongside Wolfe on the Plains of Abraham in the taking of Quebec. His brother, Lord Richard Howe, was appointed because Sir William insisted that if he was to uh, command the army, his brother must command the navy. This was very sensible because one of the greatest problems in any war is coordination between the services, but it was an even greater problem in this period because there was no uh, joint allied commander. There was no joint chief of staff. Uh, the navy was controlled separately from the army. The brothers could work together. But Lord Richard Howe illustrates one of the themes of this book, that there is a thin line between success and failure. Because Lord Richard Howe, although appointed because of his brother's wish, went on to become Britain's leading naval hero before Nelson. He won a battle called the Glorious First of June. He was a pioneer in amphibious warfare, that is using the army and the navy together. Uh, these two brothers landed 16,000 men and 40 cannon on Staten Island in early August 1776, within two and a half hours. Uh, Rick, Lord Richard Howe was responsible for introducing flat bottom ships into the British Army, who, uh, into the Navy, which were used by the Army, whose bows could go forward like gangplanks, and the troops could simply run off, much like <coughs> D-Day. John Burgoyne, until the Battle of Saratoga, was the, one of the rising stars in the British Army. He should have been more senior to Sir William Howe. He was the next in line to Sir William Howe, but for the fact that he'd spent some years as a debtor in France and had to resign his army commission uh, for several years. But Burgoyne was also an innovative military thinker. He was one of the first to really address the condition of troops in the British Army, 
after the uh, French and Indian War, uh, he'd served in Portugal, where he defended successfully Portugal against Spain. And this um, portrait, which is now in the Frick Collection, was commissioned by his commander as a reward for his successful uh, defense of Portugal. But Burgoyne went around Europe assessing all of the various armies, the Prussian army, the Austrian army, um, the French army, and he reported back to William Pitt, the elder, as to what lessons might be learned by the British army. But it was a very insightful report because it argued, and this was an important sociological <coughs> point, it argued that you couldn't just transplant uh, the different methods of different armies. He said the British soldier would never uh, tolerate the conditions of Prussian troops. It's also worth keeping in mind that John Burgoyne was a junior commander. He was never commander in chief. This war was lost by two junior commanders, John Burgoyne and Lord Cornwallis, both of whom believed in taking risks uh, against their most cautious senior commanders. Sir William Howe never lost a battle he personally commanded against Washington, and those were some of the largest of the Revolutionary War. Lord George Germain is the civilian figure most blamed for the British loss. He was Secretary of State for America, the man most responsible for the war in Britain. But Germain was a veteran administrator who'd served in the army. Uh, at one point, he commanded as many as 3,000 cavalry. And Germain was responsible for getting 35,000 men out to America in the summer of 1776, which required every merchant ship uh, in the British Marine. Uh, he had a staff of 25. Uh, he was moving troops from Germany, from southern Ireland, where a third of the British army was based as a kind of police force, and from England itself. Germain believed that the best opportunity to win this war was a knockout blow against Washington's army in 1776. The majority of mi military historians have always endorsed that view ever since. And Germain always felt betrayed by his commander in Canada, Guy Carlton, and William Howe in New York because of their interest in really trying to negotiate peace rather than in, in uh, a more ruthless conduct of the war. He argued that, in fact, it would be crueler to drag out the war, that there would be more deaths, and much you could only negotiate once you held the upper hand and had won a major victory. It might be said that there's only one biography of Lord George Germain. It's worth keeping in mind when you think of the historiography of the Civil War and how many books we have on its individual leaders. Uh, it gives us you know, at least some insight into the comparative neglect. And the same is true of Sir Henry Clinton. There is only one biography of Sir Henry Clinton. It happens to be an exceptionally good one. Some would say one of the best written about commander on either side. It's one of the few times that Bancroft Prize has been awarded to a military historian. But it was written at the height of psychohistory. And uh, it was much influenced by um, the Freudian model. And the argument of the book is essentially that he was a neurotic, uh, that he'd had a distant father and an over-domineering mother, all of which was interesting because we know almost nothing about his childhood. It is, though, true that he was a person who suffered considerable anxiety, and it's a bit like the old joke, the good news is that you are suffering from anxiety, the bad news is that you have much to be anxious about. <laughs> because Sir Henry Clinton was being expected to win this war with fewer troops, less naval support than the Howe brothers, 
at a time when Britain was simultaneously at war with first France in 1778, then Spain in 79, and then Holland in December of 1780, with much of Europe signing on to the League of Armed Neutrality, which was essentially a hostile league uh, to Britain. And Clinton was being expected to win. He was, in fact, the most cerebral of all the British commanders, and in many ways best understood the nature of this war. He knew America, like a lot of these military commanders. He'd actually grown up in New York. His, governor had been, his uh, father had been governor of New York. The family held land in America. And he saw clearly that, in fact, Britain should probably have de been defeated much earlier. He saw at least three occasions when the French Navy and the Continental Army could have imposed the kind of crushing defeat that uh, was indeed uh, achieved at Yorktown. He understood and he warned his superiors from the moment he took the senior command, which indeed he tried to refuse and he tried to resign at a time when the Prime Minister was trying to resign and the Deputy Commander-in-Chief were trying to resign as Lord Cornwallis, all in 1778. Uh, father had been Governor of New York, the family held land in America, and he saw clearly that, in fact, Britain should probably have de been defeated much earlier. He saw at least three occasions when the French Navy and the Continental Army could have imposed the kind of crushing defeat that uh, was indeed uh, achieved at Yorktown. He understood and he warned his superiors from the moment he took the senior command, which indeed he tried to refuse and he tried to resign at a time when the Prime Minister was trying to resign and the Deputy Commander-in-Chief were trying to resign as Lord Cornwallis, all in 1778. But he understood that the moment there was a superior French navy at sea, uh, there was a, a very easy opportunity for any detachment of the British Army operating outside of New York to be cut off, which is exactly what happened at Yorktown. But he understood something even more important, and that I'll come back to in my discussion of why Britain lost. He understood that this was essentially a war of hearts and minds. Indeed, he, he used the phrase, we need to win the hearts and subdue the minds of America. Uh, he understood that having civilian support was critical. He suspected much earlier than any other commander that the, the stories that were fed from home and fed to the British government about massive support for the British cause were inflated. He argued for a very gradualistic approach of training loyalist militia, working with loyalists, but never making the smash and run uh, raids. Uh, he argued you must have what he called solid campaigns. He argued the loyalists could not work without the support of the British army. They had to work together. He was, incidentally, the best read uh, member of the British military in the 18th century. There are over 30 uh, of his letter book, um, his notes, in the John Rylands Library in Manchester on military history strategy. We have no equivalent of that for any other member of the British Army. Lord Cornwallis was his junior. The two would famously feud about who was to blame for the defeat at uh, Yorktown. But I, it will suffice here to say that Cornwallis, in fact, went on to have a successful career. He was one of the few young enough to have a post-war career as Lord Lieutenant and Governor General in Bengal, in which he played a major role in the expansion of Bengal into uh, southern India in which he commanded much larger armies than he would have ever have commanded in America. And the last two chapters deal with naval 
aspects of the war that are very critical. Uh, the one person that possibly historians wouldn't necessarily expect to find in this book is Sir George Rodney, uh, who is the one person who emerged with his character <coughs> actually enhanced uh, as a result of fighting in the Revolutionary War because he captured or killed three enemy admirals. Mm -hmm. He killed, and there were three different countries and three different fleets. He killed the Dutch admiral, he captured the Spanish admiral, and he captured Admiral de Grasse, the French admiral who really inflicted the only major <coughs> naval defeat on the British since the 1690s at the Battle of the Chesapeake Capes in September of 1781. Uh, Rodney is in the book because he also played a role, a major role, in the uh, uh, moments leading up to Yorktown. Uh, in the well, often the neglected naval aspect of the final British defeat. And the very last chapter is about the Earl of Sandwich, the first Lord of the Admiralty. After Lord George Germain, he is the civilian uh, politician who was most popular to blame at the time for the war. There was even talk of trying to impeach him towards the end of Lord North's administration. Uh, he is indeed the source of the modern-day snack, the sandwich, because he liked to play hard and work hard and put meat between bread. Uh, but sandwich was blamed for the fact that Britain did not have a two-power navy during the American Revolution. The British, during the 18th century, aimed to have a two-power navy. That was to be able to defeat both uh, France and Spain together. Uh, he's unfairly blamed because even before Lexington and Concord, Sandwich was advising the government to mobilize the entire Navy. He had been administering aspects of the Navy before other government ministers had been born. And he pointed out that in every war, Britain had always been caught uh, essentially unprepared, and that the Navy had always been defeated in the early period of those wars. Uh, the classic one being the first two years of the French and Indian War. And so he argued for full mobilization. The government instead cut the Navy's budget as part of Lord North's prudence and fear of uh, national debt and the national debt crisis. And so he wasn't able to really start the rebuilding the Navy, bringing ships out of dry dock, uh, getting half-paid captains on board their ships until the middle of the war. And by 1782, the Navy was almost on a par, although not quite, with the French Navy, when in April of 1782, Rodney inflicted the great defeat on de Grasse at the Battle of the Saints, essentially uh, allowed the British to uh, uh, start negotiating peace terms and to save face and to negotiate separately with France and America. So those are the 10 key characters. Uh, these leaders are often uh, typically the ones that we blame for why the British lost. This is most noticeable in movies and in popular fiction. And I'm going to show you a clip uh, to illustrate this in a moment. Now, historians, and especially academic historians, usually don't write to dispute Mel Gibson and the movies. Uh, but I would point out that it makes its way into popular history. The classic example being Barbara Tuckman's, uh, her book, The March of Folly. A third of it is essentially uh, caricaturing this British leadership. She does it very well, incidentally, and you, as she always did, uh, was very effective in using sources. But that book really has to be understood as a book against Vietnam, and a book that regarded all war as folly. Uh, 
and it does make its way into academic history. Um, words like hidebound and incompetent are typically used to describe uh, many of the people that I've just discussed. I think, though, that popular history and movies is terribly important because they tell us a lot about the sort of folk psychology and what essentially uh, is the popular idea of what happened during the American Revolution. Now, the clip I'm going to show you is from The Patriot, and I realize you'll think this is a very low move because historians especially were critical of that uh, film. Um, not least Spike Lee, for example, criticized the uh, depiction of slavery in the film. Um, Reenactors got very upset that uh, loyalist troops were being depicted wearing red rather than green, and a lot of people attacked it. But essentially, the stereotype of Cornwallis in this film is one that you will find in all movies about the American Revolution. Um, a good example would be Al Pacino's Revolution, uh, which was the popular movie before The Patriot. In fact, I would say that the tragedy of The Patriot is it could have been the great film about the American Revolution, because there is another figure portrayed, Bannister Talton, although they don't give him his historical name, that actually is rather accurate, even though it upset people in Britain. It's um, a reasonably accurate portrayal. Uh, it might have changed the feel of the movie if all the cavalry with him had been portrayed with American accents, because they were, in fact, American loyalists. But uh, let's see how this... In the horror, our supply ship appears to have arrived. Uh, yes, 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 my lord, it has. Yes. Then why am I still wearing this rag? My lord, your replacement wardrobe is aboard ship, but uh, Colonel Tavington thought it best to secure our arms and munitions first. Uh, they are being unloaded now. You look good in that color. Mm. It's at a dead man. Then. The beast took your dogs as well. Yes, yeah. Fine animals, a gift from his majesty. Dead now, for all I know. Is there no decency? <laughs> so in the clip, Cornwallis is more concerned about his sartorial elegance and his dogs than in winning the war. I mean, he's portrayed as essentially as being a Drake Hall, the most magnificent colonial home in America. The real Cornwallis was the most aristocratic of all of the British commanders. He was also the least pretentious. Uh, this is the man who, at Ramses Mill in North Carolina, burnt his entire wagon trail, his um, tents, his equipment, uh, threw away all of the rum rations, and essentially survived as a scavenger army. Um, his commander in chief, Clinton, was appalled at what he saw, as he described as a Tartar army, a barbarian army. Uh, we don't have many. Uh, accounts by private soldiers, but of those we do, uh, they describe Cornwallis as a man they really admired because he suffered the same privations as they did. This is the man who, when he was Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, refused to live in the uh, uh, Dublin Castle, and in fact refused to have proper security, as a result of which he was nearly assassinated in Phoenix Park. And he was one of the only governor generals in India who uh, simply put aside a lot of the uh, pomp and ceremony uh, because he essentially disliked it. He was someone who would be remembered as being anti-corruption, who wherever he was refused to uh, receive two salaries uh, and to have a sinecure and essentially stood for a new ethic in government service. 
Uh, so as you can see, uh, the portrayal of him in the movie was really terribly unfair. Now, nobody in Britain is worried about such caricatures. The British produce such caricatures about their own elite. Uh, I mean, when I was growing up, you would get documentaries about the First World War with titles like Lions Led by Donkeys. <laughs> uh, even though, even though uh, the officer corps died in disproportionate numbers to the average soldier because they were leading from the front. So no one in Britain worries about these caricatures, and I certainly didn't write the book because I was concerned about the caricatures. I wrote about it because I was concerned that it distracts from the real essence of this war and understanding why the British lost it. And I think that Clinton uh, essentially was the most insightful when he said this is a war about civilian support and hearts and minds. The great British era was that they assumed the majority of Americans would support them. And they went on assuming it. Uh, like all uh, violent revolutions, the American Revolution was, of course, a civil war. Uh, there were good reasons why the British might expect a lot of support. 19,000 Americans did fight on the British side. The British were being told by Americans, but American loyalists, that four out of five Americans support Britain. Joseph Galloway, who was one of the major figures in the Continental Congress in 1775, was telling Germain just months before Yorktown that the majority of people in America supported uh, Britain. Uh, the result was that the British had an army of conquest, not an army of occupation. At some stage of the war, they were able to take every American city. But whenever they tried to take territory, they faced what today we would call insurgencies. Their power imploded. The best example is really in the American South in 1780 and 81. Clinton began the offensive in the South with the taking of Charleston in early 1780. Uh, if he'd have resigned at that moment, he would have gone down as the great British commander in America. And everyone would have assumed the war would have turned out differently if he had remained in America. A few weeks later, uh, Cornwallis won the Battle of Camden against Horatio Gates, the man who defeated Burgoyne at Saratoga. And with that defeat, much of the Continental Army in the South had either been captured or killed. And yet this was the beginning of the British problems. For a while, they thought that they had essentially gained hold of uh, South Carolina. But people who today are folk heroes, like Thomas Sumster, known as the Gamecock, or Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, uh, these people, uh, but there were some 2,000 conflicts in the South uh, in which the British Army essentially became outstretched. Uh, every post had to be garrisoned. And of course, the British control in the West collapsed with the Battle of King's Mountain, a battle at which only one British soldier was present, that was Major Patrick. Ferguson, who was commanding loyalists uh, in the West. The failure of the British to take territory meant that they had to be supplied from Britain throughout the war. They did, of course, gain some supplies uh, by negotiating behind uh, enemy lines, uh, by various methods, by pillaging. Uh, but essentially 33 tons of food a day, even the straw and fodder for horses, had to be brought out from Britain. Uh, this was really too much for the primitive administrative structure at the uh, time. Uh, the shipping was insufficient. 
Sailing dates were often delayed. At the beginning of 1779 in January, uh, Clinton only had four days rations for his troops, otherwise they were going to starve. There was no going back into the forest or going back to their farms if the British <coughs> ran out of food. Both Howe and Clinton have, are often criticized for not starting campaigns earlier in the season. And I'm afraid that logistics never makes particularly good reading. Battles are intensive, they're exciting, the fact is that they usually simply didn't have uh, the supplies they needed to begin a campaign, nor the troop reinforcements that they had been uh, promised. The problem of uh, insufficient troops was obviously made worse by the fact that it became a world war. But the global aspect of the war started before 1778. The British had to consider the possibility of French entry long before there was actual war with France. That meant keeping many more troops in England, in the Mediterranean, in Gibraltar, and in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, it also meant keeping more naval support at home. Another reason that Lord North didn't want to build up the Navy, he was worried about an arms race that would bring France prematurely into uh, the war. Um, and so they, they were having to convoy all British um, merchant fleets from 1776. So this was before the outbreak of a global war. You basically have the same problem in the Navy as in the Army, that the Navy is overstretched. The British were never able to mount a particularly effective blockade on the American coast because they really only had enough naval ships to support the army, not to do both support the army and to uh, uh, mount a blockade. Uh, there are obviously a number of other reasons, but I am prioritizing them. The British had a fragmented command structure. I mentioned earlier there was no supreme commander in chief. Uh, the problem of the waging war by departments. There were uh, some 12 different departments that dealt with the army alone. But ultimately, they were not totally defeated. Uh, it was, as George III said, still possible to carry on the war after the beginning of 1782, after the Battle of Yorktown. The main British army was still in place in New York under Sir Henry Clinton. They still had Savannah, they still had Charleston, they still had St. Augustine in East Florida, they still had uh, Canada. What really changed was opinion in the House of Commons. It was no longer possible for Lord North to maintain his majority. So even the majority of army officers, and army officers were allowed to sit in the House of Commons, even they were voting disproportionately against the war. Rather than face an actual major defeat in the House of Commons, Lord North resigned in March of 1782. And just a few weeks later, word arrived of the great British victory at the Battle of the Saints, which his government had essentially prepared and made possible. The main argument of this book was that these factors essentially precluded British success but no historian ever argues that an outcome is inevitable. We're all aware of contingencies, we're all aware of chance factors. It was therefore also the possibility that the Patriots could have lost this war. And so all of the things that we learn in high school and growing up here are also factors. The uh, quality of the marksmanship, uh, the role of the militia, the role of George Washington's leadership. It still remains miraculous, uh, even though I think after you've read this book, you'll see that the chances of a British victory were much less than you might have expected. Thank you.